Get ready. Get ready. You are about to join the crypto revolution. The crypto revolution. This is the Crypto Mastery Podcast with Kevin Jones, where we talk about the future of money and elevate your knowledge in the space. What is up, everyone? This is Kevin Jones, builder and educator in crypto, and this is the Crypto Mastery Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Speedrun Ethereum. Test your skills and learn how to build decentralized applications on Ethereum at speedrunethereum.com. Today, I will be speaking with Simone from Edge and Node. Simone is enthusiastic about simplifying the complexities of our interconnected world. He applies this passion as a developer experience manager at Edge and Node to enable the amazing projects in Web3, building exceptional decentralized experiences that leverage the graph. He joined the blockchain space professionally in 2017 as head of front end in UX at Mellonport, which is now known as Enzyme Finance. Enzyme Finance is one of the pioneering projects in DeFi and Web3 and an early adopter of the graph. All right, let's get into this. Simone, welcome to the podcast. I'm, I'm really excited to have you today. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. It's, it's really great to have you. Um, this is definitely one of my most exciting podcasts uh, this, this month. So um, how, what have you been up to? What, what, how was your uh, Christmas? How was your holiday? Yeah, um, yeah before, before, before Christmas and holidays, I was in, uh, in Bengaluru for East India. Like I traveled a lot actually the last uh, six months or so. Um, so then, then the holidays are more or less spent at home, met family and, and relaxed and chilled. So that was great. And uh, yeah, also shifting into developer experience before I did the uh, solutions engineering, which was more with the teams. And now I'm, I'm, I'm really opening up and I'm try trying to make the overall experience much better. That's awesome. How was uh, Bengaluru? I really was oh, a little bummed I didn't get to make it, but. It, it was great. It was great. I have to say like uh, the, the Indian, like kind of everybody knows that, that Indian uh, com developer community is, is strong and very good. Um, so I, I was looking forward to really uh, dive into it and see it, uh, like, uh, at, at the place. Right. Um, and it was the biggest hackathon from ETH global. I think 2000, uh, people signed up or like were accepted, but 20,000 signed up. So they had like really do, um, find, find, find the ones that can, um, be there. And what surprised me personally is like, sure, they are very high quality, very good developers. But they were very values aligned. Like they are really lo looking to build the Web three, build it decentralized, and and breaking free from authorities and uh, that that stuff. Which um, yeah, I didn't expect it to be that 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 strong. This sentiment. Yeah, I think the Web three culture in India is like really strong right now, and uh, there's a lot of awesome projects obviously coming out of there. Um, yeah, so it, it 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 must have been a really cool experience to kind of be in the middle of all that, right? Um, and yeah. to kind of see it see it on the ground, because um, you know you, you get to meet a lot of uh, people from India working at Web three, and they're all just amazing people. And so I'm sure there was a really good like vibe there uh, for that. Um, yeah, so I get I would I'd like to start out with is just like tell you know for the listeners who don't know Simone, uh, you know what. What do you do? Like, what, what, what are your goals, your passions? Or, you know, what are you excited about? Um, and just, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. I just did the, re the bio uh, for, for this podcast. Uh, so that's, that's what I am. Like, I, I started, I have a background in engineering. Like, I'm doing this for more than 15 years or so. Um, but, but during my career, I started to realize that, like, um, I, I mean, I really enjoy coding and, and developing stuff. But I... I start to realize like that I that I want to focus more on helping people build, making this all smooth, or even ma also making user experiences or now developer experiences, and in, in that direction. So that's what excites me: actually building and helping building. Yeah, yeah, I feel the same way. It's like that's part of the reason why I kind of got into like developer advocacy. It's like being being a person who likes to learn stuff and you're trying to find things on 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 the web and you're trying to find youtube videos um if you can like 
kind of properly like create something that can be easily consumed and understood by someone. Uh, it's just, it's very rewarding because they, they kind of get a leg up right on that kind of journey that they go into like learning something. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to talk about the graph, which, you know, you're obviously heavily involved in the graph. I'm also a little bit involved in the graph. So I'm excited to talk about that. It's somewhat of a complex product, but it's really not. It's, it's, uh, it's actually a really a beautiful product and we'll get there. Um, but where are you from? Uh, like, where, where are you born and raised and, and where are you living now? Yeah, I'm born and raised actually in Zurich, Switzerland, and I'm still here. Um, I would say like, uh, people in Switzerland, you usually do not move abroad like and in the us it's very common that you grew up in that city then you move there and or go there and stuff there is a little bit movement in uh, to other european cities but i would say like uh i mean the quality of life and also the, the salaries here in in zurich is just quite high so um so yeah it, uh, it was all it was also for me a little bit i always did startups and stuff here uh, i also was was a dj for example or i built a, a record label when i was younger and i always had kind of my projects here so never took the time to really go out or live in another city which i kind of regret a bit between us um i think it opens your world view if you if you jump around a bit more but luckily with my current position i have the possibility to fly around at, at least for short periods of time to this uh amazing places all over the world. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think I've seen you in at least like four or five countries. So yeah. uh, I know I know you were at, uh, in DevCon, right? Obviously, so you were in mm -hmm. Colombia, you were in Mexico, you were in yeah. New York. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, hopefully I'll see you in Tokyo uh, here in a yeah. month. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, yeah. So Denver I want to is also on the list. Oh, Denver. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, for listeners who don't know, my, I, I'm expecting a baby, so I probably won't be able to go to Denver. Um, but I'm, I'm very sad because ETH Denver was actually my first Ethereum conference that I ever went to. Um, oh, wow. And that, yeah, that's the first first time I met Austin Griffith. Uh, and uh, he kind of really like kind of sparked my my interest uh, in Web3. Uh, you as well, by the way. Um, I saw I've seen a lot of your talks before I was even uh, really a, a developer advocacy for Web3 at ETH Global Hackathon. So um, yeah, it's always oh, cool you. to like, yeah, yeah. I don't think you, I, we never talked about that, but I, I definitely saw a few of your workshops and uh, uh, I was always impressed by your delivery. So um, I want to dig a little bit into the music. So you used to DJ yeah. and you had a record label. I, I knew I knew you DJed, but I did not know about this record label. Uh, what like, what do you love about DJing and, and tell us more about this record label. Is it still around? <laughs> yeah, the story is, it's actually funny. Like, um, I think in, initially I I started like so, so there was this like when I was a teenager there was a or it's still actually there still still is but it's just sparked that of like a rap scene in Swiss German uh, so it's it's very niche obviously like nobody else in the world cares but uh, so I did so I did that stuff so I was a rapper in Swiss German and um, because I was back then already quite nerdy at some point we realized that we need beats. So I started to produce beats, which is like my entrance into producing music. And um, so it also did the beats for us. Then people kind of liked it and I started to do beats for others. And and people, uh, and then I, with, with, with other people, then at some point we were like, okay, how can we, can we publish this music? Uh, and um, there are some subsidies that you can have from the state if, you're, if you do culture in, in Zurich. So we applied for that and then we did that several times. And so people asked us to help them to apply for these subsidies. And then we said like, yeah, we can actually do a small record label that, that we have like one name for everything. Yeah. And then I did that for a while, trying to build that up. But I mean, it's, it's super hard, like, because there's no, there's basically no market or like people listen to it, but like you cannot earn money like this. And, uh, and then actually the, the, the switch came as a, as a friend of mine was like, Hey, I'm going to start to do parties. And uh, I, I kind of like the music that you do. Um, do, do you consider DJing? And I'm like, yeah, I never did it, but why not? Right. And so I, I just learned it or I got actually a friend who is DJing. And so we, we had a duo, so he knew how to DJ and then we just did it a little bit together. And interestingly, like I, I, I earned much more money by being, being a DJ than running a record label in in Swiss German rap so I switched the so kind of switched to career I was always coding on the side right like I had like my day job which was a computer like software engineering um but but yeah and then then the DJing started to to 
be much more interesting. So I, I kept doing DJing for a while until actually it was then too much. Uh, actually, with the, with the coincidence, as soon as I started to get into Web3, like I started to realize that then I need focus and I can't, you know, go, uh, be on parties on the weekend and, and then hang over on the Monday and, and, and DJing and stuff. So I, yeah. I then put it on hold, actually. Yeah, DJing is a rough life, you know, like you got to stay up all night and then, you you know, if you want to do anything the next day, you're probably tired and yeah. it's just, yeah, it's a real, it's a real sink. And music's just interesting to me, especially for like artists and like DJs, like, you know, it's such like a expressive thing and like there's some really talented people out there, uh, but it, it can be challenging to break into, like you're saying, it's, yeah. it's just a difficult thing and uh, to do it full time for the rest of your life is, is pretty hard. So I think Web3 is a, a good option for you. <laughs> You're probably yeah. better at, at Web3 than DJing, but I don't know. I got to hear your stuff. So um, Yeah, so I, I was not the best one, obviously. I mean, like, like if you, I would say if you're really talented, like I have friends of mine who started with me DJing and now they are flying all over the world and really making like good, good money. Um, but, you know, these people are like from the beginning, like looking back, they're super talented, went to music schools and uh, and, and then they, they really they really put all the bets on wall, all all the bets on one horse. Right. And said like, OK, teaching it will be. And, and then they moved to Berlin or whatever to keep the living cost low and, and, and grinding from there. And at some point then it goes. But I was never like as talented, as driven, and uh, at, them, at that point I said like, yeah. I'm sure you're talented. I definitely want to hear you DJ. One of these uh, hackathons, we'll have to bring our controller with us, and yeah, <laughs> we can uh, do a hotel party or something. <laughs> I had actually a, a, a um, like a comeback in uh, Amsterdam. Like there was oh, a nice. developer, the developer DAO meet uh, or developer DAO meetup or party. Uh, they somehow found out that I was a DJ and they were like, Hey, uh, Simone, you need to, you need to play. And then I, um, yeah, prepared another set. It was mostly old tracks, but still like I did it again for two hours or something like that. Kind of the warm up. Then they had like a proper DJ after me. <laughs> yeah. I think after the, everyone listens to this podcast, people are going to be asking you to DJ at, uh, ETH Global Hackathons now. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. great. Okay. So, um, so, your, your journey into technology. I mean, you said you got into coding, but how did you get there? And like, uh, I guess, how did you get into Web3, like both? Yeah, coding for me, so, so the story is that like, that my my father at some point just gave me and my elder brother a, what was it? You know, the IBM i386 or something? Mm -hmm. Like this really old thing with, with, with the, the, the computer that they used for the first Mars mission, no, moon mission i think that's the story so we just had to thing at home with floppy drive and everything and i was quite young I, I don't remember like maybe below 10. um and then we just had it and we there wasn't much to do actually right on this thing so we just played around it was it's quite funny when i think back like we just started to you know boot it up played around learned some some basic commands that you couldn't use in ms dos and and at some point we realized oh there's actually a programming language i think it was yeah it was basic so we tried to do to program some stuff in basic kind of super super simple games uh like i don't know like we, we did we did that stuff and at some point i think flash came and html css so so we played around a little bit with this stuff um but yeah and then i went into high to high school and I kind of did not code on the side anymore and uh, yeah also the whole, whole rap thing started and then I dropped out of high school and uh, um, and was looking for an apprenticeship. And then I had an apprenticeship at uh, the Swiss Broadcasting Company in uh, IT systems. So I so I was in the team that runs the server there and uh, the IT infrastructure. And so I was able to learn this. But I, I thought like, yeah, it's cool actually. I kind of like computers, but it's still audio is a thing um, with music that that kind of matches. But during that time working there, I started to really rediscover and say like, ah, software engineering is actually the coolest thing. And, and so I did it more and more and more in that in that situation. And at some point I switched over to a dev shop that did it professionally. And, and there I really learned like how to build a website, how to ship, how to deliver, how to work with customers, deliver on time, that stuff. Then I then I pivoted a little bit. There I did full stack. Then I at some point, actually when Node.js came out and Meteor, I was like, 
and we did the backends in Python and the frontend with JavaScript, like HTML, CSS, and jQuery. But as soon as Node.js and Ethereum came, I was like, actually, I want to double down on JavaScript. That that will be the language because it's the only language as of now, and and still actually, interestingly, ten years later or so, that you can use server and client side, and you can write this back in the days so-called isomorphic apps, right, where you can share mm-hmm. logic in the front end and back end. And so I I jumped on this wagon, and I think soon a friend asked me to start to start a startup, and. Um, yeah, and then I was, so to say, the CTO of that startup. I mean, it was kind of a CEO, CTO thing, like two people. And uh, and we started to build this. It was a booking platform for DJs. Um, so again, kind of make, made sense what we do on the side. He was actually the, the promoter that first started to do parties and book me, my first booker also. Oh, and cool. then, we st- then we did this thing and, and I built everything from scratch. We launched two products, one uh, the really the platform but the other like, a very small one where you can just have a, a dj profile something like a about me website um yeah and after a while uh i was like okay the music business is hard um i i, I want to do something else and uh, and that was just the beginning of the 2017 ico hype and uh so, so I, sh- I sold my shares and and uh started to work for Melonport. So they were actually actively looking for for f- front-enders, basically. So I started to work with them and uh, helping to build the front-end, uh, hiring into the front-end team. And um, yeah, and then we built the whole front-end in, in two years or so. And back in the days, it was 2017. I mean, like a lot of the tooling that we use right now didn't exist. So hard hat didn't exist, for example. Uh, Ethers, I think, didn't exist initially. And um, yeah, the, the graph didn't exist, so it was very rough to build to build stuff. And we were also st- still like Enzyme is still c- committed to the full decentralization, although they they have now I think some c- parts of servers, but but it's on their vision still. And b- back then we were kind of very like it needs to be fully decentralized, no servers like from the beginning. So we did weird stuff like you had to download the Electron app that indexes the blockchain for you on your computer, which so you started it and then you first you wait to 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending like how old the protocol already is to have the interface. Yeah, that was funny. And uh, yeah, and, after, and and that's why that's how I got in touch with the graph, actually, because as soon as the graph came up, I was already into graph QL, like we already started to build a data layer inside of this app that is by graph QL. So you have like a best practices and then separations of concerns. And um, so I was thinking about like, yeah, how to do this decentralized and not on your computer, you kind of need this thing where you have like uh, uh, your your data indexed by different people across the world and, and you need to have some certainties about it, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, the rough sketch I had in my mind. And then when I see, when I saw what they want to do, I'm like, wow, that's great. Like they do exactly that, what I think that we need. And then we got in touch very early on. Like uh, I think Enzyme was, one of the first users of the graph, and uh, it's one of the first, also one of the first projects that migrated to the decentralized network, and uh, yeah, that is still very strong that relationship. That's awesome. Yeah, and that was one of the things about the graph that you know kind of excited me is based on GraphQL, and it solved this kind of like little problem that was like going to be huge in the in the future, um, and. Uh, yeah, that on top of, you know, just like the support and like the documentation for the graph is just so well done. Um, it's really mm-hmm. easy to kind of like get your fingers and we're going to dive in more into the graph. Um, but yeah, that's great. So uh, as far as like your excitement about Web3, like, you know, how optimistic are you for for the future of Web3 and how optimistic are you with like, um, I guess, accomplishing like kind of a, a higher level of adoption? in web3 in the coming coming years that's a very good question um so recently i started to have the the thought actually before the bear market hit that obviously we are in an echo chamber right so we all telling each other like yeah it will be the thing web3 is the future and stuff and so i was wondering myself or like think about what are we missing is there something that we are missing like is there a is there really a you know, a bear case or, or even a, you know, a killer case that, that the whole thing doesn't work out. 
with with Ethereum and with blockchain in general. And I mean, there are, in my opinion, I mean that there are some threats, but I'm not sure if they're existential. Um, so, for example, like if if really regulation starts to go in, and if it's stupid regulation that um, you know the the kind of stuff that SPF pushed for. Where, where it really starts to limit access to the decentralized exchanges, for example, for, for financial stuff, that could become hard, kind of. But I, I still think like you would need to have like global coordination of really pushing this back, and that's hard to achieve. Um, there will always be like some state that thinks like yeah, actually for us it's an opportunity, and what we already see with tax havens like Switzerland or Cayman Islands that that kind of a little bit go on that so but still it, it will probably uh, break like make everything and uh, adoption much slower that's for sure but i think it, it just makes it slower then at, at some point uh, the technology by itself i mean decentralized technology by itself is very resist- resilient to threats like this so you for example we see like the main example email it's still like it's still the one that everybody talks about, but it's a very old protocol. But it's set up completely decentralized. I mean, if, if Google goes down, out of business or whatsoever, email is still there. And uh, I think, yeah, same is for Ethereum or for Bitcoin. Like they are, like yeah, they are still there. Like it's hard if, if Coinbase is out, they are still there. If if uh, uh, I know Binance goes out, it's still there. And so. The resilience is is strong, but the adoption, I know it. I think it needs a killer case, and that we didn't see, see outside of DeFi. Uh, that that everybody thinks like, oh, now I need to be part of it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Some people are saying that like uh, DeFi was kind of like the first wave, uh, NFTs was kind of like the second wave, and then now it's like social media, social graphs are an interesting aspect as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course, like blockchain data, right. I think is a huge part of that, um, figuring out ways that we can actually like manage the data at high scale, right. Like high, high, high amounts of data, um, and keeping that available. Yeah, I, I agree with you too. And I think the politics side of it is, uh, it's a different, it's a difficult one to navigate because, you know, blockchain and crypto is kind of a complex subject. Um, Mm -hmm. and a lot of people are quick to kind of judge it, especially from a a political standpoint, uh, especially given like some of the, like the issues like with SPF, which is more of like a centralization company issue has nothing to do with the the blockchain or crypto markets. So I I think it could be, you know, that that will slow us down a little bit, but uh, like you said, I think it's global coordination would be required to Mm -hmm. really stop what what's happening with that too. So that's good. Um, yeah, so I'd like to get a little bit into like, the, so, you know, obviously you work at Edge and Node and then yeah. Edge and Node has one of their products, the Graph, but tell us a little bit about Edge and Node and like some of the products that, that they offer. Yeah, sure. So Edge and Node is um, the, the first core dev behind the Graph. So basically it is, uh, it, it when when the Graph launched the network, uh, there was the, the Graph Foundation, which is the, the steward of, of everything. And then first there was Edge Node as uh, the company that builds everything. Um, but at the same point, uh, I think the Graph Foundation and the Graph Technical Council are already looking for other core devs. I don't know the detail there, but I think it, at, at least it was the, the plan from the beginning. So the idea is to build the Graph, but also to make it more resilient and more decentralized like to have set the different core devs w- working on it. So if one core dev, for example, goes down or get into regulatory problems or whatsoever, like there is another one that could jump in, for example. Um, but also, yeah, to have, to have more more diversity in thoughts and, and contributions. Um, so yeah, but back to Edge Node, it's the first core dev. And build the products or, or the main out, outcomes are it's it's the business team of the graph, so to say, like the, the edge node business team drives most business initiatives from from the graph. It's also building the protocol, so the smart contracts engineers are mainly at edge node. It builds the graph node, uh, which is the core infrastructure that run that can index subgraphs. Um, it also offers the hosted service, 
which was was on the path for the graph. So first, the graph node was just open source. Then the hosted service was built as a proof of concept, also also product market fit, kind of just unpaid. Um, so so people can use that centralized service and see the power of subgraphs, and that that is provided and built and provided by Edge Node. Um, yeah, so that's our now also the subgraph studio and the graph explorer are products built by Edge Node for the graph. Yeah, awesome. And as far as um, you know, the graph goes, um, you know, obviously it's based on GraphQL, right? Um, but like. If someone is listening is like, all right, well, like, why would I use the graph in my application? Um, like, what are what are the problems that really the graph aims to solve? And like, why do blockchains need the graph? Yeah, <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> um, I mean, that's for me, that's also very personal uh, because so good web apps back in the days and still, I think it's still true. Uh, at, at some point, you build in this data layer. So you have in a in a web app, basically you have data. You have different data sources. Some is some is your database, but uh, it could also be that you have some APIs that that you query or whatever. Like you couldn't, you have a whole system behind it. But the front end should be separated from the complexity of the underlying system by just one API or one data layer. And GraphQL was this language that pioneered that approach. Uh, that that you can have a front end and the front end can query exactly the data that it needs in one query to build the whole the whole page um it was actually invented at at, at facebook um yeah to, to to streamline this communication and as soon as i started to build on top of, of graphql uh, the whole system architecture of, of, of an application or a web application started to be for me very clean and very clean separation of concerns it also speeds up development workflows because you can have the API layer implemented in GraphQL, which is um, which is strictly typed, without having actually the backend com completely integrated, and the frontend team can already start to build on top of it. So this is the industry standard and the best practice uh, that's around for more than ten years, I think, and I, th I think still it's 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 the best. Um, now going to blockchain development, right? Um, you the, the interaction is with you don't have a database but you have the blockchain so you want to access data on the blockchain but the blockchain is actually a shared data store between you and everybody else and um and now how to access the blockchain from a from a front-end perspective or from a techno technological perspective what you do have you have the json rpc interface which which basically says it's a remote procedure call interface so what you do is you can you can send like very small commands and get responses from the blockchain stuff like oh i want to send a transaction so you sign a transaction and you send it to it or i want to see if there are any logs or whatever but like it's the the interface by itself i think it's a machine to machine interface that you don't necessarily want to have in in the setup of having a front end in the web deployed and then it communicates to this chase narcs interface it's never never built never intended for that but most, like, yeah, especially when I started, but, but still, interestingly, a lot of frontends still directly created this JSON RPC interface um, for data reading. I mean, for writing, I think there is no good alternative yet, but for reading, it, it is definitely not, not built for. And it's very, it's very inefficient. You start to send thousands of queries and that gets very expensive when you have, uh, when you need to pay for them um, and so on and so forth. So. I was always thinking about what, what we need is actually a GraphQL layer in between that that only has that data available that you need in your front end, kind of pre-organized. And that's exactly what the graph does in a decentralized way. So I think for like professional web apps or for professional dApps, the graph is a, a central and crucial part of the stack. Yeah, and especially I think from a performance perspective too, right? Like, especially like when I first started building smart contracts on Solidity and I started messing with events and trying to parse that stuff in my front end, it just it just gets real clunky, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You just like, you're trying to do all this stuff and you know, you hit the refresh button and it's like, da -da 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 -da, and it's like you're watching an old video game from like <laughs> the yeah. 80s, you know, like processing your data. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's definitely an edge for performance, simplicity, architecture, um, 
and yeah, just overall, I think the graph is just this amazing tool that um, I see the the future of like Web three and blockchain. It's it's going to be required, right? That you build on something like that. Um, yeah. So l- let's say that I'm a developer, right? And I want to get started building on the graph. Like, where should I go to start uh, learning about it? Um, what would you recommend? I know there's lots of tutorials. If anyone's listening on YouTube, probably from you or workshops. Um, but you know, wh- where should people go to to learn about how to build on the graph? Yeah, so basically the, the entry point is the graph.com slash docs. Uh, as you, you said, like uh, the, the docs are good. Um, yeah, I think we should improve them, but they're good. <laughs> and we will improve also, like they will be they will become much better. Um, so there you learn about subgraph development, but and, and the graph in general, you can read everything. But I would say like uh, there is one one very common use case that I also should start to show later showcase at hackathons is Mm -hmm. you already have a smart contract deployed maybe on a test net or or on your local dev chain or let's say a test net and now you want to build the front end on top of it and and you start to uh pull your hair because like it's so messy to get get with this json rpc stuff to get the data into the front end then what you should do is like there is a i think my first video about this was at east san francisco so you should go go for the Yes, we're in the shirt. <laughs> yeah, you should check the Eve San Francisco, uh, the graph workshop given by me, um, where it really starts exactly at that problem. So you have it, you have your contracts deployed already somewhere. They are working. You can interact with them, but now you want to build the graph on top. And then there is the, it, then you can do it in. If you know how to do it, you can do it in five minutes. And that's what I'm trying to showcase there. So you don't need to learn everything about like what is a subgraph, how. I mean, there is this, this language you, um, called assembly script that you write your subgraphs in, which is similar to TypeScript, but a little bit different. It can be intimidating initially and, st- and so on and so forth. So in that workshop, I really bring that five minutes, no code approach actually to just boom, have a subgraph on top of your existing contracts. And as soon as you have that, in my opinion, um, for me always is like when I do these quick start tutorials, I immediately lose fear of the technology as soon as I see it's it's working, right? I see the code, I can run it on my local machine, I can compile it, uh, maybe have some dev tooling. In VS Code, it's good dev tooling that helps you explore the, the objects that are important and stuff. Then you can just a little bit start to play around, but you always know that you have like a working baseline. So that's my suggestion, actually, that path, if you want to get started, if you are in that situation. Yeah, I think, you know, there's going to be a wide, wide array of listeners uh, probably on this, right? Some people are probably just getting in and interested about Web3. And I think you've answered a lot of questions about why the graph is so important. Uh, We've also covered a little bit of like, you know, why a developer cares, right? A little bit about it. Um, What about the, the, the more advanced user that wants to get a little bit more involved in the community, right? Um, can you talk a little bit about the Graph Advocates program and the Graph Advocates DAO and kind of explain that, what that is and um, how people can get involved there? Yeah, sure. Um, so the Graph Advocates this, or the Graph Advocates DAO, it's, it's, it's a DAO that is funded by the Graph Foundation or by the, 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 the treasury of the Graph um, with the focus of, of having uh, people across the world that, that help to distribute the word or like pass on the word about the graph. Um, it is explicitly explicitly no, a non-technical group. So you don't need to understand how to write subgraphs or everything. It is just like you need to roughly understand what the graph is and then you can participate. You can participate by organizing local meetups or writing content, uh, help translating the website. Um, and uh, there is also a grants committee that you can can be part of. And so it's all about just organizing people from the community together and also having the possibility to to earn something a little bit on the side by participating there and and, and do what's needed. So that's the graph advocates. But if you really want to become, uh, if you want to be more technical, what we're currently ramping up is the subgraph DAO. And so the subgraph DAO also, you are obviously invited to join Kevin, but everybody else that's listening in and, and is a subgraph developer or an aspiring subgraph developer, this will be the place to learn about subgraphs. But if you're already 
advanced in it, then it would also be the place to exchange ideas, work on standards with authors, or uh, if you're a good subcraft developer and you're up to uh, develop being, the developing subcrafts for, for a client or for a project, then it's also a good place to be there and participate. Um, so it will be more of this guild of subcraft developers that, 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 that come together and um, yeah, work in the subcraft now. So these, these are the two things. But other than that, I mean, obviously you can just come to the Discord. You don't need to part be in a DAO. You can go to the Discord, and uh, we have very helpful people in the Discord, advocates mostly that are uh, helping out and answering questions and helping you in your journey into the graph. That's awesome. Yeah, I really love the community aspect that the graph has really established. Um, the Discord server is amazing. Um, you know, there's a wide array of people in there that are willing to help you. Um, there's a lot of interesting uh, graph advocates that are excited about it. Um, uh, developer relations and developer advocacy, people like you. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really great. Um, what does the future look like for the graph? Like, what are, are there going to be new products coming out? Um, or are there going to be new feature requests on the graph? Uh, I should say for Edge and Notable, there will be new products. Or for the graph, like, what does the roadmap look, look there? Yeah, so the big news, or like, it's not news, is um, that we launched a decentralized graph network. Um, I think it's now more than half year, one and a half year ago, where you were really able to uh, publish subgraphs to the decentralized graph network and have it indexed by, uh, I think it's almost 300 indexes, if not more right now. Um, so that's super, that's super great. Uh, it was only possible on Ethereum mainnet so far. Um, and so now the pro like the main focus is really to bring more and more subcraft to this decentralized network, make the decentralized network better and, and, and faster and more resilient. Um, it's, it's already better. Like we see currently the, the, the quality of service on overall the, the, of the graph decentralized network is better than the hosted service because you have like multiple indexes indexing your subgraph. So this is the main focus. So now we have the Ethereum mainnet uh, that, that you can have the subgraphs there. Um, Recently, we started to integrate with Gnosis Chain. So there are first, first subgraphs indexing Gnosis Chain, which are coming right now to the to the graph decentralized network. But uh, Polygon was announced, and then over the over the the, the next year, we will uh, enable all chains, most probably on the decentralized network. Important here is there was a little bit confusion about an announcement that we will shut down the hosted service by end of Q1 2023. Um, that won't be the case unless we really have a much better service on the host on the decentralized network than on the host service in terms of quality of service, but also on of developer experience. Currently, to de de publish a subgraph on the decentralized network, um, you need to be you need to kind of unfold your DGEN skills. So you need to uh, it's an on-chain transaction. You need to signal some GRT to to participate in the game theory on the protocol. Um, you need to load an API key with uh, on Arbitrum. It was on Polygon for a while. We just recently migrated the building to Arbitrum, so it's a bit easier. Um, but we are really working on on this on a process that feeds for you as smooth as it would be like a, as a centralized service, but in a decentralized way. So these are the, the main focuses. Um, other than that, it's worth noting that we have also this new exciting technology called substreams in the making. So I talked before about the core dev. So Edge Node is the first core dev working on the graph, but the second core dev is streaming fast. I think they joined more than a year ago, if I remember correctly. And so they are like really these data pipeline specialists that are very good at, at this and with substreams. And there's also this other technology called Firehose. They really reimagine how data is indexed or extracted and processed from the blockchain. Um, so to give a quick overview how this works maybe is currently a subgraph is a, is a sequential process that it looks at one block, it, it sees uh, which uh, events and transactions are interesting, then takes that out, reads something maybe from the database and writes something back to the database. Maybe it even calls back to the blockchain and gets more information about that block. And then so on so forth, like block one, block two, block three, block four, and it's, it's a sequential and also blocking process. Like whenever you read from the database, it waits until it's there. Whenever you read back from the blockchain, it waits until you have the data. So that's very, that's, that's good, but it's not 
it's it's good to reason about. It's easier to reason about, but it's it's hard to speed up that process uh, because when you do process speed ups in in uh, information or like in computer science, what you need is parallelization. Um, also, it is it is using the JSON RPC interface, which again, even though on a server and then then you have the cache, it is inefficient. And so there is the Firehose technology, also developed by Streamingfast, that uh, is is a way of quickly uh, extract data from from a blockchain. So it is an alternative to JSON RPC, but really optimized for for speed on, and processing data out. So what it basically do, does is like you can look at the blockchain as a just you know like information or transactions stacked on each on top of each other, and uh, the the Firehose blasts this data out into flat files that you can highly parallelize them. And so you have like really the, the whole block written down to a file. Okay, and that's what the Firehose does, like very quick. Standardized also across blockchains, so the Firehose can be used on uh, on RV, Ethereum, obviously EVM compatibles like Polygon, but also uh, Polkadot is, is, is on the way near. Uh, Aptos integration, I think they, they worked on. So, so that's the Firehose, it's very cool. And then on top of that, now we have this stream of block data. Uh, you you want to refine it, right? So for your specific front end, you have specific needs. You are only interested maybe in the NFT trades of, of board apes, how much they, they change in prices, or maybe you're only interested in some, some charts about the price developments, whatever it is. Uh, you want to refine that stream of data. And that's where substreams coming in. It's also a parallelizable modular thing. Of it's, it's more like working with a MapReduce in the pipeline approach for the JavaScript uh, pros uh, amongst us. It's, uh, it, it reminds me of RxJS, this reactive programming, where you really have a stream of data and, and work on that stream. And that's a very new paradigm. Uh, you write the substreams in Rust. And uh, it also works like you can write substreams per se, but the output of a substream is just also a stream of data. Um, so this technology, like one of the next steps would be integrated with subgraph so that you can have like a substream that fills the database, the same database that you are used and love from the, from the graph. And then you can query with the same GraphQL API. So this is one approach, but you can also use substream for other stuff. Maybe if you do have, I know, high frequency trading, needing like as real time data from the blockchain as possible. And Substream is definitely an interesting technology to look into. So these are these, the, the big um, things. Oh, maybe also worth noting is um, Messari joined also as a core dev. That, that there is a team at Messari that is a core dev working for the graph. And they are building these high quality standardized subgraphs across different protocols across different chains. I think it's more than 200 subgraphs that they are building and, and counting. And it's, it's very great. Like if you're a developer uh, or not even developer, also data scientists looking at good data about the protocols and you love GraphQL, then you should definitely look into the subgraphs by um, Messari. Uh, they are very cool. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting, cool stuff coming out of the graph. It's, uh, it's amazing how the graph continues to evolve and kind of grow on itself. And, you know, it's just, it's really an incredible, uh, incredible product and incredible company that's behind it. So really excited mm -hmm. for the future of the graph. Um, so I want to kind of reel back a little bit and just talk about um, developer advocacy, developer relations. How did you get into that kind of realm? Because, you know, you were a coder, um, you know, you, you did the music thing, but like, what brought you into this kind of like role where you're, you know, publicly speaking about uh, the graph and helping kind of move that forward? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I, I I wasn't aware, actually, that this would be something that I, that I, I wasn't aware that this even exists and I didn't know how to, how to get into this. Um, <laughs> but it, the story is, maybe the fun story is like, while I was coding at, uh, at Melonport or Enzyme, um, there were always these conferences, like my first conference was DEF CON in uh, Cancun. And yeah, we were, we, we were going there as a whole team, but there were other conferences like, um, I think Messari Mainnet also started soon then and then Consensus and stuff and ECC. And uh, I always wanted to go to these conferences, but uh, it was like, yeah, but you know, you need to ship. You can't just hang out at these conferences. Uh, someone needs to ship, right? And I, I mean, that makes sense. Um, 
I understand it from a business perspective. But me personally, I want to be at all these conferences. Like I love to hang out with these people, exchange ideas, uh, be at the parties and, you know, meet strang some strangers, just have like a nice chat about something else. And then later on, you realize like that it's actually a very interesting contact also for business. So the whole community, I, I really enjoyed. And, uh, and, but I didn't know like that there was a particular uh, like role for that. Um, and so when I joined the graph, I was actually asked, do you want to do you want to do more front end or do you want to do solutions engineering? And I'm like, yeah, actually, I never heard about solutions engineering, but that sounds fun because uh, it is engineering, but it's also more outside and more with the people and more at the conferences. So uh, I did front end a lot. I love it. But let's try this something new. And then I did it and then I started doing it and then I started to realize like, actually, I, I love doing this. I, I, I still love talking with people and, and, and understand what they're doing, going on calls with them. And they show me the current system architecture, how they, how they do it. And then I can help them going to the conferences, then also doing the workshops, doing the talks. Uh, it's something that I like. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of engineers, especially, they do not like to travel, interestingly. They want to stay at home and code, which which is fine, which I understand. But I love to travel. I love to, to be with those people. And it seemed to be like very natural. And, and then I was like kind of lucky that I'm that role that that works. And I could also then do more and more stuff um, in that regard, go to more conferences and uh, more hackathons. And uh, yeah. That's yeah, I, I agree. It. It's, yeah, it's fun. It's fun to be on the on the ground and uh, helping people. And, you know, even at, uh, just East San Francisco, you know, this last time, you know, some, some of you listening might know that I do the photography for a lot of ETH global events. And, uh, it was kind of fun because I was bouncing around taking photos. And then I was also helping, uh, some developers with scaffold ETH at the same time. So I'd go into the room, check on them and help them out and get them up and running. And, uh, they ended up winning, winning a bounty, which was great. So, um, I kind of felt like it was very, it's very rewarding, right. To do something like that. Um, we help people, especially at like a hackathon or, you, you know, if it's a company that's trying to build something um, that's really going to revolutionize Web3, like, and just to be a part of that, which, you know, probably 99% of the time the graph is going to be a part of that, right? Um, so that's that's great. So what advice would you have for someone who wants to get into developer advocacy or developer relations? Um, what would you say to them? Like, hey, you know, this is what you should do. Yeah. Um... That's a good question. <laughs> no, I mean, generally, uh, I would say you, if you, if you want to get into it, um, and, and if you want to get hired for such a role, I think the best thing would be to make yourself seen by that protocol or that company before you apply. Um, that means a start to work. I mean, you could. There are a lot of people that that are just starting to, to write tutorials or doing some videos about it or doing some tweet threads and whatever content that you like to do, do it already for them. Um, that gives yourself the ability first to learn, to practice, um, to make yourself a name regardless of who hires you. Uh, if, if you're good at it and you make good tutorials, you can grow up your, your audience already and then and then you can start to reach out to, to, to those companies and then uh, eventually you, you get hired. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great start. Yeah, I agree. That's kind of how my journey was as far as with like helping with Scaffold ETH is like I started creating my own content, right? Um, created some, some, uh, some different posts. I created some videos and got my hands dirty and showed like kind of my proof uh, that I can actually do this, right? <clears throat> so yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, so uh, what what do you think about, you know, I know we're in a bear market right now. I think we've said that a few times on this podcast. Um, and I know like crypto is kind of unpredictable, but like, what are you excited about for this year? Um, and what do you think it holds for like crypto in 2023? Yeah, um, I mean, bear markets for me actually are builders or biddles markets. Um, that's, I kind of like, I mean, I feel bad for everybody that lost a lot of money in the in the recent uh, events, for sure. Um, but the good thing is that that now kind of the so-called mercenaries or the gamblers, they are out usually. So everything calms down a bit, you know, like the ones that stay are usually high quality because they believe in the longer future and they're not, they're not just here for the for the big money or like the quick money. 
Um, and also you, you see the ecosystem is coming closer together, like people are talking more with each other and, and start to collaborate more, exchanging more ideas. Um, so it is, it's a calmer time, but it's good to build, it's good to, sh to, to ship. And I would say also from the outside, if you assess a company or a protocol, I would say one of the most important metrics is like how many bear markets did they did they uh, survive, right? So, and and uh, it, now it's interesting. Like the, the graph, I think they launched launched in a bear, in a bear market. Like it, it really started. They did not they did not wave the ICO hype like like Melonport actually started it or more or less. Mm -hmm. um, but but still, like because. They, they knew it is it is valuable technology and uh, there were, was the vision of Web3. We didn't talk talk about Web3 back then, I think. And uh, and uh, yeah, and, and to have this value and then just building and, and, and doing it and, and improving, go to the hackathons. So that that's very good in a bear market. Uh, so everything is calm um, and you can build, you can sit and learn. And yeah, that's good. That's a good part of it. Yeah, I agree. Like if you were to actually walk into uh, an ETH Global Hackathon or uh, a crypto conference, uh, you probably wouldn't even realize that it's a bear market, right? Because everyone's just kind of excited about building. Um, mm. And, you know, when you see these developers like building just like some awesome stuff, especially like in San Francisco, there's just some really cool products people built. There's a lot of innovation. Um, there's a lot of excitement. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm highly optimistic for 2023. Um, I think we could still obviously see like the market come down, but I also think that like, we're definitely at a good spot where, like you said, uh, a lot of the gamblers are out of the game. Right. And now it's just a time to like build. Um, and hopefully we don't see anything, uh, stupid come out of, uh, regulation <laughs> out of Washington. That's going to hurt the market more. Um, but yeah. Okay. So, uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, your advice for someone who wants to work in crypto. We talked a little bit about developer advocacy or, um, but I'm, I'm kind of interested in what you think about people that want to learn just more about crypto in general, like maybe about blockchain or Ethereum or uh, any other kind of crypto. Like where would you recommend that they go and how, how, how would they get involved? Yeah, I would say like the good thing about crypto actually is that it is very, it's a very young and, and a fresh scene still, interestingly. Um, and I, I would say like the, the main thing is just get involved. You know, don't st don't stay at the, at the signed lines, not just, you know, reading on Twitter, but actually, you know, start to comment, start to ask questions, go into those discords, whatever, but also, you know, participate in the protocols, whatever it is. I mean, make a loan on Aave, uh, buy some nfts i think uh and, and now maybe nfts that will be valuable at some point might be cheap right now who knows maybe not i know investment advice but uh <laughs> but 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 anyways collect some pull-ups uh make a lens profile and start to, to be active there um start delegating on the graph uh whatever just just get engaged just play around with it and then and then listen to yourself and 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 find out what what's fun you know where do you think like wow that's actually fun you know some people just like trading some people just like coding just people like to make videos some people like to be on discord all day and you know chatting with people that would be great community managers for example and and but you need to start doing it because standing on the sidelines, then you you don't experience what's going on. Go to the conferences, come to hackathons, hang out with Kevin and me at the at the next uh, hackathons coming up, hopefully East Toronto, uh, and uh, hack and and talk to people. And and then I think like then it will be natural that you learn that you get to know people that you like, then you get you do stuff that you start to understand that you are good at, and then you like it or vice versa. Um, and I think that that should be the approach and uh, just fun, playful and yeah, getting in there, get involved. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, I agree with you 100%. It's like there's definitely different uh, passions that people have uh, about, you know, whatever aspect of crypto. Um, and you can apply that in different ways, right? And different paths uh, along your journey. So, yeah, if you're interested in something, just dig into it. And uh, I think crypto is kind of like a self uh, revolutionary thing inside, you know, that has to happen. You know, you go down the, the rabbit hole, so to speak. And, um, you know, it, you, you'll learn 
uh, as you go through that experience, right? As you kind of dive in and get the different levels, uh, levels of crypto uh, knowledge that you need. Um, great. So Samo, what, what else do you do besides uh, DJ and Web3 and, uh, you know, what, what hobbies do you got? You got anything you'd like to do for fun? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to say, I still kind of enjoy clubbing from time to time, although I'm also getting older. But uh, I think it is it is a, it is a culture, and a, uh, it's still a culture that I appreciate uh, the electronic music culture. Um, but besides that, uh, I also discovered hiking as something that really calms me down. You know, walking around and and uh, that gives me also great thoughts uh, with friends or alone. Um, something that that's cool. That's cool. I'm also a foodie, so I. I love to explore good good restaurants or even cook at home. Like I often cook after after work it's because I'm working in, in the Europe time zone. I usually work until eight p.m. Then after that, I go into the kitchen and, and cook something small, like not not big stuff, but like a little bit. And that also calms me down and doing something with my hands. So uh, yeah, that's that's mostly what I do outside of being in crypto. <laughs> Awesome. So, I, w w what is the next event you're going to go to? Uh, that we'll have to go get some food, and uh, maybe it, do some clubbing. <laughs> I right tonight. Um, no, not tonight. Like, no, what's the next event you're going to? <laughs> we oh, could okay. go tonight. I could, I could get on a plane and, and be there soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it probably yeah, it takes a while. Um, I did, I did that. Like Zurich, San Francisco, it's twelve hours. From here to there, I think backwards it's a little bit quicker because of the winds. Um, but next will be Denver. Yeah, it looks ah, like yeah, I'm going to Denver. Um, looking okay. forward. Like last year was my first time in Denver, interestingly, and this was full, like full bull market. It was like pumping and 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 very. You, you saw that like you had what, what, this 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 new rich, new rich new crypto people coming in, which is I mean it's cool they come. But now I'm kind of curious to looking forward who will go there and what will be the vibes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's uh, I was there last year and uh, I think Dead Mouse was DJing and yeah. then like Tiesto was like at an event. I'm like, this is crazy. Like number one DJ yeah. in the world is DJing a crypto event in Denver. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I'm excited and you'll have to tell me all about it. Unfortunately, I probably won't be there. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see. I might be able to do like an overnight, but I, I don't think it's going to happen. So, um, but yeah, I, I want to thank you so much, Simone, for coming on the podcast. It's it's really been a pleasure to to learn more about you. I learned a lot about you to, that I didn't know today. You even taught me a few things. Um, and so it's really interesting to see what you're doing and the work you're doing in the space. Um, so where can people learn more about you um, and kind of what you're working on? Yeah, easiest probably is Twitter. You know, like uh, I'm... On Twitter, I'm Schmidt C, like Schmidt underline SI, but um, it's maybe uh, easier to go to schmidtc.eth.link, you know, my NIMI website. Um, it's S C H M I D S I dot ETH dot link. And there you find everything like my Discord, my Twitter, my, I think even LinkedIn is there, uh, but also Lens profile where I'm kind of starting to get more active. Um, yeah, that's probably the best place. Okay, yeah, and for anyone listening, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes for you so you guys can just easily go there and search for it. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Simone. It's it's really been great, and uh, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was fun. Yeah, thank you. See ya. See you soon.